Now in Romans chapter 16, what I'm going to be preaching about tonight is really what the first half of this chapter deals with. And I think it's amazing that God has dedicated, God has allowed for his, in his word. I mean, the Bible's really not that big of a book, right? I mean, you find a lot of important truths and doctrines. Everything's important in the Bible. But when we go through, the, we, re we read the first half of this chapter, of chapter 16 in the book of Romans. It's all basically Paul saying, you know, Salute this person, salute that person. This is my fellow laborer, you know. Greet this person, greet that person. And he's mentioning all of these different people by name. All of these great Christians by name. And what I want to, what the point I want to make about that is, you know, we as Christians ought to be supportive and encouraging and thinking about and praying for and, and just having people in your minds, other Christians, whether they be part of your church or not part of your church. I mean, the Apostle Paul here, he's talking about a lot of different people. They weren't all with him. They weren't all part of his, even necessarily his home church. But he was thinking about them. And I'm, I'm thinking about all of the names that he mentioned. And I want you to think for yourself. Would you say that you even know that many Christians? Do you even know that many people by name? And that's saying, do you know him? But do you know him by name? Do you know him enough to say, you know, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. You know, likewise, greet the church that is in their house. He says, salute my well-beloved Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. Greet Mary. So he's saying, I mean, it's men, it's women. There's all of these different Christians that have been great laborers together with him in the gospel of Christ. People who are actually doing the work for Jesus Christ. People that he cares about. He says, in the, even in the first verse, I commend unto you Phoebe our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Sancria. And he lists off all these. Now I look, I understand that Paul traveled around quite a bit. Right? He was getting churches started. He was evangelizing. And he had an opportunity to meet a lot of people. But I would encourage you, you know, maybe you don't travel very much. But when you do, for one, when you take a vacation, if you go away somewhere, you know, you ought to always be finding a church to go to. I, I don't believe in when you take a vacation, just say, well, I'm taking a vacation from church. I'm taking a vacation from God. God is not someone or something that you take a vacation from. Right? You want to you take some time and relax. Hey, go do it. I'm all for it. I take vacations too. I think from time to time, you know, you work real hard and there's nothing wrong with getting some rest, going out, traveling, doing whatever. But you always ought to, to have that type of level of importance in your life that church should have, of congregating with, you know, together with other believers and just saying, you know what, I'm going to take, I'm, I have this day set apart or these days set apart and I'm going to worship God and I'm going to go to church and I'm going to congregate together because you need that. And that's not something you ought to be taking a vacation from. But when you do that, let's say you go and do that, you know, try to, try to get to know the people where you go and visit. Learn, you know, get to know other believers and other workers together in Christ. And even if you have, if you have an opportunity, go soul winning with them. My wife and I did that. We went to, on vacation once in, uh, in was it Georgia? And, you know, we found out when this, you know, tried to find the best church. I think we had to drive like over an hour to get to the church because it's the only one that seemed decent and that had like a soul winning time. But we showed up early, you know, and we, we went to go out knocking on doors. And uh, unfortunately, no one from the church was, was there to go out with us. But we went and knocked doors anyways. We went out soul winning. And it was a great experience. And you know what? That's uh, honestly, that's one of the most memorable things that I take away from that, from that vacation was my wife and I going soul winning and her winning a young child to the Lord. Like, we did a lot of things on that trip and I couldn't tell you everything that we did. But I remember that. And it's a meaningful experience. But I kind of digress from, where, from, from the point where I'm getting at here. You know, Paul is thinking about and praying for all of these various individuals that he knows. And he knows them well. One of the reasons why he knows them though is because he's worked with them. He's done a lot of work together. And you know, it's one thing to, uh, you know, especially in church, you get to know who people are. You get to know their names. Maybe you chat a little bit here and there. But you don't really know someone until you've like done extra work, spent extra time together outside of church. And, I, and you know, I could look around. Everybody here tonight 
I have done, you know, I, I feel close to. Like you're, a, you're not just people I know from church. You're all friends. Because individually, we've all gone out soul winning. We've all done other things together. We've gotten to get, you know, done some other work together, what have you. Those are all things that are important. You know, the church should be like a family to you. Your church is, is you know, your brothers and sisters in Christ. And people that you need to be continually be thinking about and praying for and keeping in remembrance. Now, a lot of that love that you have for your church members is going to be uh, demonstrated through prayer, through just asking people, you know, sending them text messages, hey, how you doing? You know, keeping up with people. And, uh, the, you know, that little bit goes a long way. And as a church, we need to be, you know, really pulling things together and really be unified as a church in, you know, in a un come together in the unity of faith. And one thing that's going to drive that apart where you're not going to have unity is when you start uh, getting factions within a church. And you've got to watch out for this. And as churches tend to grow, it, it's, it's kind of a natural thing that begins to happen. You start getting cliques of people and groups of people. And, well, these are my friends and I only talk to them and I don't talk to those people, you know, because I don't like whatever about them. And you start getting these little groups of people together. And honestly, it may seem harmless at first, but that gets to be divisive. You start getting the gossiping back and forth about people. And honestly, you know, everyone's going to be, and especially in a growing church, in a church that's getting bigger, you know, you're going to have people that are at all different levels of their spiritual walk. And for those of us that have been a Christian for a long time or that have grown and matured spiritually for a long time and, and you've gotten a lot of sins out of your life, don't forget where you came from. Don't look at other people that might be newer to church and that have a lot of sin still in their life because they haven't grown yet. They haven't learned that yet. They haven't gotten a lot of things out yet. They're still growing. They're, they still have a lot of room. Give them that room to grow. Don't just, just treat them like an outcast because they go to the movies or because they listen to worldly music. Or whatever you have, you know, all these things that you don't do. Hey, good job and congratulations for, for getting a lot of sin out of your life. And I mean that. But don't look down upon other people in the church to the point where I'm not going to talk to that person because they're, you know, whatever. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We are going to see an instance where we need to separate and where that time does come where you say, you know what? I am not going to talk to that person anymore. But we're going to see what the Bible says. And we should not be adding anything to what the Bible says about this or diminishing anything from it either. I mean, if, if you know someone that's a brother or sister in Christ that's guilty of these sins, hey, we need to just follow what the Bible prescribes for that. Now, all of this is encompassed in, in the love that you should have for other people in the church. Whether it's a positive thing where you're praying for someone and, and talking to them and edifying them and keeping them up, or whether it comes in way of a rebuke. Because the rebuke ought to be because you care about that person and you love them, and because you honestly love them enough to let them know that they need to be rebuked. Now, this isn't something that happens, that should be happening all the time, right? They should be... Um, that something that's a little bit more, I don't want to call it an extreme case, but it's, but it's not, uh, it shouldn't be something that happens regularly where someone really needs to be called out and corrected. But um, let's, re let's reading, uh, turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're actually going to read this whole chapter. We're going to go through this whole chapter. Starting in verse number 1, the Bible reads, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as, not, as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, in my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So here we see something that's going on at the church in Corinth, 
where there is a, there was a man who was actually he was committing fornication, but it was his father's wife, right? I assume it was an ex-wife, you know, but but he's taken her like as his girlfriend in the church. Not only is nobody like rebuking him and calling it out and saying, this is wicked, you know, we got to get this guy out of here. It's as they were puffed up and as if, hey, there's nothing wrong. Hey, this is just fine. Hey, yeah, come on in, brother. We're serving the Lord together. This is the attitude that they had. And Paul's saying, look, I don't even need to be there. I don't need to hear all the special service. Oh, well, you understand. They really love each other and they're really serving God and they go out so much. Look, he doesn't need to hear all these. He's like, I've already judged. This is wickedness. I already, I don't even need to be there. I already know what needs to be done. He needs to be delivered unto Satan. Because it's needful for them to be humbled and to bro be brought down in order for them to repent and correct this the extreme wickedness that's going on. And this isn't just some little sin either, by the way. And we're going to get to that. It's not like you need to be on a crusade and figure out, Oh, this, you know what, this person listened to the radio the other day and I, you know, I saw them in their car and they were, they were jamming out to some music. So I'm just going to call them out. I'm going to deliver that person unto Satan. That's not what this is saying. I mean, this is, he's saying like the Gentiles don't even do this stuff. They don't even talk about it. He's like, this is a bad sin. And look at what it says here. Let's continue. He says in verse six, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Now look at this. He says, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. He's saying, look, if you don't ever, if you never spend time around the people that do these things, he's like talking about just your general unsaved person. He's like, you'd need to just go out of the world completely. You'd have to just completely isolate yourself because these people are all over the place in the world. But it's not something that should be all over the place in church. Church should be sanctified. It should be set apart. As God's people, we should be holy unto Him and should not be partakers of these wicked sins that is just fine in the world's eyes. We need to be different. And that's why he says, so he says in verse 11, But now I have written unto you not to keep company. Look at this. If any man that is called a brother. Now, I want to, take, to pause on that. Someone being called a brother is this somebody, like if you just went out last week and got someone saved and that person, you know, showed up to church for the very first time. Now, would they be a brother in Christ? Yes, because they got saved. So if they're a child of God and you're a child of God, then you're brothers, you know. But would you start calling them brother so-and-so like right away? You know, bro, you know. Brother George just got, you know, this is Brother George and all this other stuff. In church, you know, usually when you talk, when you, when you kind of get, it's, it's almost like a title that's given. Where someone's, you know, Brother Sebastian or Brother Jerry or Brother Paul. And, and you've kind of been in for a while. You've heard a lot of the preaching and you've had a chance to grow. Right? Yeah. We're not talking, because everybody starts off with, with a lot of sin in their life usually. Usually there's a lot of stuff that needs to change. And the, the, the salvation happens in a moment. But the actual repentance of, of changing different things and trying to get sins out of your life and all that stuff, that takes time. And we need to be long-suffering and merciful unto people who had just gotten saved. And they need to even hear. Because a lot of times people don't even realize that things are sins that really are sins. And I'll give you a perfect example. My wife, she was never brought up being taught the Bible at all. Just extremely ignorant of God's Word. And, you know, for, you know through no fault of her own, that's just how she was brought up. She just never knew anything about it. She, um, when she got saved, you know, she started coming to church a little bit here and there and, and learned a little bit, but she still didn't know a lot of things. Like, unless it was taught upon, she didn't really know about it. So like for a long time, she didn't even know that drinking alcohol was a sin. She didn't know that that was wrong. She didn't know that it was wrong to get drunk. And 
It wasn't until she heard it from the Bible to know that that was wrong. So you can't just like say, oh, well, you know, you're a drunk, you get out of here to someone who hasn't even heard that before, right? And look at this list, what it says. It says, verse 11, but now I've written unto you not to keep company. If any man is called a brother, be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one, no, not to eat. Now, I'm not saying that my wife was a drunkard, okay? But if she were, Right, let's just say she were a drunkard and she comes to church. They're not say, it's, this isn't saying to just completely break off fellowship with her the first day that she shows up to church after she gets saved. Right? Now, obviously, you need, to, you need to, to use a little sense in figuring out how long someone should kind of be around and hear these things. Because there's certain sins, especially the really bad sins, they need to be corrected more quickly than, than a lot of the other sins that are in your life because they're, they're serious. They're a big deal. You know, if, something, if God calls something an abomination, you need to be quitting that right away. And if it's any of the, the sins on this list, you need to be getting that out of your life pretty quick. And, but the way that you do that, you could treat that person in love, showing them, hey, you know, look at what the Bible says here. And hopefully you've got a preacher or a pastor that's, that's, that's hitting on sin and that this stuff's going to be coming up regularly anyways so that they can get and receive that stuff, um, you know, pretty quickly early on that they can grow. But this is referring to people that know better. This is if so you've got someone that's been in church for a while, they, you know, you know that drinking's wrong. You know that it's wrong. Idolatry is wrong. You know that it, extortion's wrong. You know, you know that these things are wrong. You know that these are sins. And you know that these are wicked sins. If you, you find someone like that, he's saying, that's the person you ought not to even be going to eat with. Don't even have a meal with that person. And here's why. You know, a lot of people, it, it's easy to hear this preach and say, oh, yeah, right on, amen, brother. It's another thing to put it into practice. What happens if that's a person that's been your friend for a long time? Right? Someone that, that you've gotten kind of close to in church and then they start backsliding. And you may not even necessarily realize it. There's people that have come and gone through church. People who have been zealous and on fire and serving God that end up backsliding without you even realizing it. And then the next thing you know, they're just gone and out of church. And then you show up, you call them, you try to talk to them or whatever, and they're just completely back in the world. And it's sad. And you don't know it, but here's the thing. When you, if you find out about that, you need to have the courage and the, you know, the guts to be able to just say, no, you're, you know, you're in a wicked sin and I'm not even going to eat with you. You know, you need to get right with God. But here's the thing. When they get right with God, and this is the last point of my sermon, you need to be able to accept that person back and to forgive them. We need to have unity in the church. As I mentioned earlier, you know, there's these factions and stuff. First of all, you ought to be able to go around and even, I understand it gets harder the more people that there are to kind of get to know everybody. But you always ought to be friendly with the people in church no matter what. Not be gossiping and talking about them behind their back or be worried, especially the, the, the newer saved people, all these different sins that they're involved with and whatever. Now, you know, you want to help them along, but it's in love. It doesn't necessarily need a rebuke. When you get someone that's been in church for a little while and they're called a brother and they're involved in this, yes, now it's rebuke time. Now it's time where you just, you draw that line and you say, you know what? No. It's time for the tough love. Because that's what they need. If you just pretend and look the other way like nothing's wrong and just try to ignore that and just, just I don't want to think about that because I like hanging out with this person. I still want to, because a lot of people will think this, well, if I shun him, then he's just going to completely turn his back on God. And this is the mindset, right? And this is what you need to avoid. The mindset of thinking, well, you know, I want to just try to, you know, if I keep him just as long as possible, just keep him coming back into church, you know, maybe hopefully they'll just get right. No, there comes a point where they just got to get out and they need to be separated because the Bible says a little leaven leaven at the whole lump. And when you bring in that wickedness into church, it's going to be a lot more likely, especially when, you know, they start backsliding, they know better and they're in no, knowingly just getting into the sin. It's going to be a lot more likely that they're going to be bringing other people down with them as opposed to you bringing them along. And besides, the Bible says don't even sit down to eat with them. 
you need to have the courage to say, you know what? It's not, it makes me uncomfortable. I don't like the feeling that I get when I have to say this to you, but I'm going to say it anyways because it's right and because it's for your own good. And if you love some, if you truly love your brother in Christ, you're going to be able to tell them, you're in sin, you need to repent, and I'm not going to have anything to do with you until you do. On these matters, on the matters that we just saw in this chapter. But don't be, then don't continue to take this though out and just expand it to all kinds of other sins though either. That's the other, the other side. You take it too far to the extreme of where you're just every little thing that someone does. I mean, look, we're all still sinners. You look at my life hard enough, you're going to find some sin in it, okay? And just like everybody else that's here today, we're not perfect. So you, you can't just be hammering on people over everything that's in their life, every sin. There's ways of showing people things out of the Bible, what's right, without, without just, just going all out or, or refusing to have anything to do with them. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Because my last point is being able to forgive, right? When you have someone that's either done you wrong or has gotten involved in one of these major sins or whatever the case may be, we need to be in our churches and just in our lives with other Christians, we need to be able to be humble ourselves, not to be proud and lifted up. So like if someone were to do you wrong, to just say, well, I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna talk to that person again. I don't, I don't like that, you know, like they did me wrong, they stole from me, they did, you know, whatever. I'm just gonna have nothing to do with them again. That's wrong. That's the wrong attitude. What if, what if God had that attitude with you? He's done me wrong. I'm not gonna. I'm, yeah. I'm not gonna answer his prayers now. I'm not gonna listen to a word he has to say. He's done me wrong. Okay, and obviously we're not better than Jesus. We're not better than God. We've wronged other people. We need to have a forgiving attitude. Look at Second Corinthians chapter two, verse number one. Oh, I flipped the First Corinthians two. There we go. Second Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 1, the Bible reads, But I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. For if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad, but the same which is made sorry by me? And I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears. Not that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. So that contrarywise ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest peradventure such an one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. So here's what he's saying. You know, this is the second letter of the Corinthians. Now he's writing unto them again. He's mentioned in the first, in the first epistle a lot of things that they were doing wrong. And saying, look, you need to get this right. You guys are doing this wrong. Hey, I heard that there's fornication among you. And he's kind of rebuking them a lot. And he mentions how like, you know, at first, you know, I was sorry that I, that I had sent this unto you because, because it made him sad. But then he's like, you know, but that was only for a second. I realized, no, I'm not sorry because they needed to hear that, even if it does make them sad, because that's what, what prompts them and provoked them unto change, unto getting those things right. If he just never would have mentioned it, they, probably, they would still be in that sin. He's like, it was necessary and needful for you to hear this because a godly sorrow worketh repentance. And that godly sorrow, when you, when you hear the things that you've done wrong, you change them. So what Paul's saying here then, look at, he says, sufficient to such a man, he's talking about a person, is this punishment which was inflicted of many. He's like, look, this guy got inflicted of many. I mean, he, he had served his punishment, okay? But he's done with that now. We need to, to, to quit with the punishing. He says, so that contrarywise, you ought rather to forgive him. He's like, now it's time to forgive him. He's done wrong. He's been punished. And, and he's repented. Now it's time 
to forgive. And what always goes along with forgiveness is forgetting. You have to be able to completely let it go. If you can't let something go, then you don't fully forgive somebody. You have to be able to just not think about it anymore. You have to be, if someone does you wrong, you can't just always just be, be thinking, well, that person still did, you know, like, because that's going to make you bitter against them. If you're going to forgive them, you just have to completely forgive them and just let it all be in the past the same way that Christ has forgiven your sins and he's white. He doesn't, he has no memory of them. He says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as God separated us from our sin. I mean, it is just, just completely separate. Out of our, out of his mind, it should be out of our minds. Because what will happen? He says, lest such an one, lest perhaps such an one should be swallowed up with over much sorrow. See, it gets to the point where you just, you just keep on holding something over their head and you can't forgive them and they've repented. Now, they're kind of like, well, what else can I do? You know, I've gotten this all right, but people are still going to be treating me bad. I'm still going to be receiving this punishment. It's like, what else can I do? That person's going to be eaten up with over much sorrow. And that's going to make them feel defeated and not edified and not, you know, what else can you do? It's like, it's like when you, uh, you know, people commit bad crimes and now they have to carry this record around with them everywhere they go. And there's no forgiveness in that. It's like, you know, people who are trying, they, they, they recognize they've screwed up. Say, look, I know I've done wrong. I know I've hurt other people. I've paid a punishment for my crime. But now I'm done. Now I want to do what's right. And it's like they go to try to find a job and do what's right. And that just follows them around everywhere. And they just, they just can't get work, you know. Um, and that's not right. You know, when, when someone gets things right, when they have true repentance... They need to be able to move on with their life. And we shouldn't be holding stuff over and over their heads. In verse 8, he says, Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. So he's saying, look, now I'm commanding you. I'm beseeching you. Please, you know, I'm begging you. Confirm your love towards him. Verse 9, For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. So he's saying, this is a true test. I'm writing unto you now so that I know that you're obedient in all things. They were obedient unto Paul when he wrote the first time. And they were able to mete out the punishment that was necessary. They were able to get the people out of the church that needed to be kicked out. He's saying, but now they've repented. Now they're coming back. Now it's time for me to prove you. Are you will, really willing to be obedient now and accept that person back and to forgive that person? And to not hang that over their head anymore. That's going to be the true test of your faith and of your love. Are you willing to do that? Verse 10. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ. Look at this. Verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage over of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We need to be able to forgive people because if you, if you can't, then Satan is going to have an advantage. He's going to use that to his advantage to, to, for one, to get that person who's trying to do right again and just to get them back out of church and get them back into whatever sins they were doing or whatever it may be. But also, you know, if that person still keeps coming back, Yet you're bitter against them. Now it's going to start this, this division and splitting, this unhealthy division within the church that ought not to be there. And Satan's going to get an advantage over you and, so, and will be able to use that lack of forgiveness to be able to, to start pitting people against each other in the church. And I'll tell you what, I mean, so many churches go through these church splits. And we need to make sure, and, and you as church members need to make sure that that never happens as, far, as long as, as you're around and as long as, as much as you can help it. That you need to be on the lookout for these things happening and people kind of getting clicky and, and, and just talking bad about these other people at church. Look, they're your brothers and sisters in Christ. If they haven't done anything, you know, that, that, that's worthy of them kicked out, getting kicked out, then they're part of the church. Maybe they need a little bit of... of, of loving, you know, showing them the truth and love and having the spirit of meekness and showing them an error. Maybe if it's, if it's something that's kind of, you could tell it's maybe getting out of control and they need to be brought to their attention, then do so because you love that person. But you should never, and even if they respond badly to that, 
and they get angry at you, don't be bitter against that person. You ought to be able to forgive them. Because oftentimes that's going to happen from someone. Usually it's going to be cases where people aren't quite spiritually grown that much yet. And those of us that are spiritually grown, don't let yourself get puffed up and haughty and start to have an arrogant attitude of being better than all these other people because you don't sin nearly as much as them. And that is another problem that comes even out, out of our movement, out of, out of people who try to live a really holy life. You know, you get this holier than thou type of an attitude where you just start thinking that you're so great and all these other people are just, just evil and wicked and sinners. No, they're your brothers and sisters in Christ in church. And, um, you know, we ought not to have that attitude. And, and you know what? When people are kicked out or if they have to leave church, when they come back, when they've done right and they're allowed back in church, water under the bridge. Shouldn't he, don't even talk about those things. Don't, you know, and, and here's the other thing. My last point. You know, sometimes people don't get kicked out of the church, but maybe they get backslidden. They leave. And I've seen this happen. It takes, it's going to take them a lot more guts and effort to show their face back up to church. Maybe they've been out for a year. And maybe you know that they've just been doing all kinds of things they shouldn't have been doing. Because you see it on Facebook or whatever, you know, whatever. You know, so, you know somehow you find out about, you know, things that they've been doing and it's not right and they've been in sin. But when they come back, you shouldn't then approach and be like, so where have you been? You know, like, where have you been for the past year? You heathen, what are you doing out of church? You know, don't, don't throw that in their face. Obviously, they're coming back to church. All right, don't beat them down about the sins. Apparently, you know, when people do that, they don't get kicked out, but they just kind of get out of church, they backslide. When you see them back in church, it's probably pretty safe to assume they're repenting of what, of what they've done and they want to get right with God. Encourage that person. Hey, brother, how you doing? You know, I, all, I've, I've done this plenty of times because I've, I've seen it happen a bunch of times in the years that I've been going to church. People come back and say, oh, hey, it's really good to see you. How how you doing? How, you know, just, you don't have to bring up anything. Just make them feel welcome. Make them feel like that, you know, they're part of the family. That's what the way that, the, in the story of the prodigal son, that's what God did. It, the, in, well, symbolically in the, in the story, right? It's a parable of the rich, you know, the man that, that he has two sons and the one son wants his inheritance right now and he goes and he wastes it and he goes off into sin and everything else. But when he comes back, you know, he, he blew everything that he had. All of his dad's money, all of his inheritance, everything. Blew it all, wasted it all, got in all kinds of sin, lived in riotous living, you know, partied it up. And then is finally so humbled he decides to come back home. And what does his dad do? Does he say, you're so stupid. What have you been doing? You know, I can't believe you did all this. No, none of that. His son knows it was stupid. He knows it all. He's coming back humbled. He welcomes him. And he says, let's have a party. I'm so glad that you are back here, my son. That's the attitude that we ought to have when people get out of church or even get kicked out of church, but they're, but they're able to come back. I am so glad that you're back. We, you know, we are just, just thrilled to have you here. Anything that might have happened in the past, it's in the past. It's over. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this time that we have tonight. God, I pray that you would please strengthen our relationships. Strengthen us as brothers and sisters, dear God. Help us to uh, grow closer together and closer to you, dear good Lord, that we might honestly be um, and sincerely be praying for each other, be praying for other people, praying for other churches, praying for, for all the people that we know and greeting people by name and, and, and really taking an interest in other people's lives, dear Lord, to, to keep us strengthened as a body, as, as part of the body of Christ, dear Lord, to, to be able to do and work together and do as much as we possibly can to the glory of you, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.